this video will help you decide if the Hawaii sailors adrift for five months story can be explained by a lack of charts which prevented them from entering ports, a lack of a dinghy that prevented them from anchoring out, a lack of an autopilot that prevented them from steering straight. We'll separate fact from fiction and let you decide. Did you have a chart plotter? No, I use paper charts. So, so the only GPS you had was the handheld, or was there another no, GPS? we had two GPSs. Both of them were Garmin. Okay. Uh, one of them had a, a screen probably larger than your, your laptop screen there, and it was in color, and we could look all over the world. But what I've learned about GPSs is sometimes they don't match exactly what the paper chart says. Like you can have things in, in the Garmin that are five miles away from where they actually are in reality. So my experience been to always use paper charts as the law and use the GPS as a secondary backup. So the, the Garmin chart plotter with the screen, uh, did it have charts loaded on it or no? Yeah. It, it did. It did have, you did have charts. Did you get the charts for French Polynesia before you left? Uh, I think actually it had the entire Pacific Ocean from the California coast over to about the end of the Hawaiian Islands on it. Garmin's runoff chart chips, the chart chip that covers the California coast in Hawaii does not cover any islands in the South Pacific, including Christmas Island, Tahiti, French Polynesia, the Cooks, and it also does not cover North Pacific islands, such as Wake Island or Midway. In short, they lacked electronic charts that would have allowed them to zoom in to anchorages and see where they could enter the pass and anchor safely. Oh, it would quit working on <laughs> throughout the whole trip. There's so many times you wrote GPS quit. It was unreal. Okay, so sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah. So, like I said, the handheld never quit. It always had a battery backup. It was wonderful. The big one would quit because I have no idea why, and we would just reset it and turn it back on. But 100% of the time, we use paper charts. Okay, yeah. Always. Well, I think, you know, the, 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 the thing is that I... The GPS positions are 100% accurate, but the charts overlaid on the GPS positions are not necessarily accurate. Uh, so I don't think generally the paper charts are just as accurate as the electronic charts, but that doesn't mean that they're accurate. <laughs> well, and I, I know an attorney who, who lost his keel uh, in the Hawaiian island chain by hitting something, an obstacle that was on the, I think it was in the Penguin Bank yeah. that wasn't on the charts, and he ended up getting a new boat because of it. In an email to Slow Boat Sailing, Jennifer Appel said that they did not have paper charts that allowed them to see the islands of Christmas Island, Kiribati, the Northern Cooks, or Wake Island, all places they said they passed by. Instead, they hailed islands on the GPS like they hailed Christmas Island because they lacked harbor charts that would have shown them the depths in the anchorages and the depths and locations of the passes. Uh, we were at Christmas Island on the 16th and we circled it on the 16th. We circled it on the 17th. That's when we were told that we were too, our draft was too deep to enter the lagoon. There was no protected anchorage available for rigging repairs. We cruised out of there on the morning of the 18th. Who did you hail then? Channel 16, they call it the calling station. Okay, they, so you hailed them on channel 16, and do you know who responded? The, the calling, calling station? station the calling station on channel 16. <laughs> the calling station, okay, so. That's what you, they called themselves. Okay, so you, you don't know who that was, but maybe some sort of port captain or something, but. <laughs> no, I think it was somebody's nephew. Uh, but somebody told you that eight and a half feet was too big to, and I mean, what were you gonna? I, you know, I look at the charts, and I, I know you have the charts, and it seems like eight and a half feet's not a, you could anchor there, but 
Maybe somebody's told you. When the you. calling station on channel 16 says you may not enter. You may not it. enter. So it sounded, you thought it was someone official that was telling you you couldn't enter? That, I'm just, yeah. Okay. He laughed at me when I told him I needed 10 feet in order to safely navigate. And he, he just started laughing. He said, we don't even have that. Uh, we don't have that. See, I don't see that on the charts, though. I see that you, if you drew 15 feet, you could anchor there. So I don't, but... I'm sorry somebody gave you bad advice. It's really nasty. Jennifer Appel told Sailing Anarchy she had to hand steer and she did not feel comfortable with Tasha steering in the Northern Cooks. She said in a Sailing Anarchy forum that she was out of money for an autopilot by the time she got done with the rigging work and left without one. I spoke to Michael Krynan of Honolulu, an architect who worked with Jennifer Appel. It's not at all clear that Ms. Appel or Ms. Fuyava had a dinghy to get ashore, and that may have explained why they were reluctant to stop at any islands. Do you know if she had a dinghy? Oh, yeah, she had a dinghy. Oh, yeah. And she had an outboard, and she had an outboard stolen, and she got a replacement outboard, and the replacement outboard wasn't a good one. So that went on for about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but she eventually got another outboard? Yeah, she bought another outboard. There's a photo in, in that article. In the Daily Mail, they show her paddling. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a photograph that I gave. Oh, okay. Okay, so that was in 2016 or something? Or? That was this year. 2017. You cannot see the hard-sided dinghy on deck in this U.S. Navy footage. Further, Ms. Apple swam out to the Taiwanese fishing vessel rescuers. We did hail a number of different ships that we saw during the five months. Uh, no one had responded until we saw the Taiwanese fishing vessel. The fishing vessel was very kind, but they were not adept at towing the boat, and additional structural damage occurred during the 24 hours that we were with them. So they graciously allowed me to swim over to their boat to make a, a mayday call because we probably had less than 24 hours before our boat sank if we continued on with them. I contacted Jennifer Apple via email uh, to confirm if she had bought another dinghy, but she r did not respond. Don't trust other people to do it for you. Because once they do something, if you have no idea what they've done, then by the time you realize there's a problem, you're so far behind the eight ball trying to fix it, you may not even have the parts. I mean, like the spreader wasn't attached to the mast correctly, and it doesn't matter how many times I tighten the rigging, when the, when the spreader is at the root collar is not attached properly and the angles are off, you're screwed. I mean, you're straight up screwed. There's nothing you can do out there in the ocean trying to fix this. So you think the spreader was poorly attached before you left Honolulu? If I had thought that it was poorly attached, I wouldn't have gone. But in retrospect, you think that it was poorly I put on? I can't do that. All I can say is I have a video at the end of the trip showing the patches that I made in okay. order to keep us moving. Okay, so maybe the, maybe the rig was okay before you left. I don't know. The rigger said that it was okay to go. Okay. Michael Krynan told me that Jennifer expressed concerns about the rig and he thought they would be expensive repairs in the $20,000 range. She told him this before she left Honolulu for Tahiti. You can hear that interview right now. When you're on her boat, you, you felt like it was fairly well kitted out? You felt like it was, uh, the stuff was pretty new or it was just kind of real old? Oh, and... yeah. No, no, it was, no, it, it was, it was good. It was pretty solid. The proposition that she had was that she was going to have to need about, I don't know, at least 20 grand to, to do her mast. I, I don't know anything really about how well put together the mast was. Yeah, it's always questionable in boats. What was and, wrong um, with the mast? Well, she seemed to think that there was something wrong with the mast when I wanted to report.
sports that uh, came in and the rigging not necessarily got sour, but you know, it, you don't have to have much go wrong with a mast to stop you wanting to fly your kite or, you know, just, you know, storm jet. So that was after she was rescued, not before that you thought about that? No, it was before. Before, okay. And that was for or after she hired the rigger. The, she the she she's always talking about the rigger she hired and the rigger made mistakes. Uh, uh, and so I guess you know I guess the tension in my mind is that she talks about hiring people, but I always you know I think that her budget is not so big. Uh, so I her budget's not big at all. <laughs> right. So I'm but, wondering but she, how much she spent she, on these people. At all, so you're trying. You're saying that you think there was something maybe not so great about the rigging before she left. I would never go out on a, a boat, especially on a voyage like that, unless I had all new rigging. And I don't think she had all new rigging. And if she had a rigger doing something, I don't know how, how much of a problem you would have. But knowing what goes on that part of the world in Honolulu, who knows? It may have been secondhand rigging. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I guess in my mind, there's there's always this question, like, was she very tightly constrained by her budget or, or not so much? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, no, she was, she was testing. She was testing reality with, with the way she was living. Michael Krynan told me that Jennifer had to scrape and save for a $4,000 roller furling. And in part, that's one of the reasons why he doubted that she had the $20,000 that she thought she needed to fix the rig. Nevertheless, Ms. Appel showed a invoice for $17,000 to the Sailing Anarchy podcast. So it does appear that she did pay nearly $20,000 to fix the rig. And she says it was the work was completed in April 2017, right before they left in May. Slowboat Sailing has contacted the rigger in question in Hawaii for comment and has received no response. We're talking about somebody who is, a, is, a, is a, to me, a completely free spirit. She's had the glamorous life. She's done this. She's done that. She's conquered this. She's conquered that. She hasn't necessarily come out broken by it, but she's, she's got experiences in her life that you know, I, I would want, there's experiences that I wouldn't want, but she, um, she, she plays, um, she, she, she sails close to the windows, goes as fast as she can possibly go. She's got a, uh, an adrenaline, a love for adrenaline. This video was supported by Mantis Anchors, Sail Timer Wind Instrument, and viewers like you on patreon.com slash slowboatsailing. Subscribe so you can get all our new episodes of Around the World Vlog and any updates to the crazy Hawaiian sailor tales by hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell icon.